Yeah, I mean, as you said, um, in, in the research for the films, we did look at every second of every minute of every hour of piece of footage that exists uh, on Martin Luther King. Um, not only that, but I've read all seven volumes of his books, of his papers. And in those papers, you have uh, sermons that he delivered. And in none of those things did I ever find him actually preaching the gospel without some kind of uh, ulterior uh, political motive. Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Chad O. Jackson. You may recognize him from the fabulous films Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom 2. I, I tell you, I'm really excited to have him on this program. He's a brilliant man. He is smart beyond his years. I don't want to ask you how old you are, Chad, but you are you really inspire me in your intellect and your the perception and perspective that you give to just the culture that's going on right now. So how are you doing today? And just tell us what's going on in your life right now. Hey, Kyle, I appreciate you saying that. Um, uh, I'm doing fine. And uh, what's going on in my life right now? Um, we're kind of in between films. We just finished Uncle Tom 2. And, uh, you know, we have a couple of options in terms of, you know, where to go next, whether we immediately go into Uncle Tom 3 or whether we uh, pick up on some of the other films that we've started. Um, uh, for me, I'm focusing more on my company. I have a plumbing company here in Texas. So that's where all of my focus and attention uh, is at this at this moment. Um, I have been getting a lot of, uh, of I guess, uh, encouragement, for lack of a better word, from people to consider uh, writing or starting a podcast or what have you. And I've dabbled and flirted with some of those things. Uh, I have been writing for the past eight years or so, but it, most of it is like stream of consciousness type stuff. So um, it, it will be a task in itself to begin the work of of putting some of those things into a palatable, uh, you know, um, journal for consumption and, and turn into a book or what have you. So, you know, I got a couple of options, but, you know, first and foremost is to ensure that my bills are paid. And the best way to do that is to is to continue with my small business. So that's where my focus is mostly these days. So. Hope that answers your question. Oh, it does. It does. In fact, let's um let's touch a little bit on your small business because that's mm -hmm. kind of the crux of our society, our fabric. Really, it's family and small business. My mm -hmm. father was a small business owner growing up in the D.C. area, and he, I watched him literally turn into a very successful company in the D.C. Mm -hmm. area. And I just understand how that brought the family together. Mom was working here. Dad, my mm -hmm. brother was working here. My sister was working here. My aunt and the people he employed, the lives he changed. And I just want your, your opinion, because I don't think people talk about that enough. I and mean, maybe you haven't heard people talk about that enough. But in terms of your business, how has that changed your life in terms of being a decision owner? And I'm, I'm not sure if you have employees, but just that kind of impact that you have on other people's lives because you're actually doing it yourself and creating something that wasn't there before you got there. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I started my business when I was 26 years old, 25, 26, somewhere around there. Uh, it started off as a thing that was just me. Um, I was a sole proprietor and um, I kind of wanted it that way. I didn't really want to immediately start hiring uh, customers or I'm sorry, uh, employees. And I wanted to just be able to be a, a freelancer, as it were, um, building a customer base and not really hiring employees until I had no other choice because I had so much work to to keep up with. But it just so happened that um, there were some friends that I had who, after learning that I started my business, they kind of quit what they were doing and just assumed that I would hire them. And so, you know, me being the person I, I, I am, just decided to take on these these new employees uh, two or three weeks after having started my, my company. Um, thankfully, uh, the customer base really did you know, take off. It was a, I thought it would be kind of like a sprinkle and then gradually, you know, become rain and then gradually become a snowfall, but it was pretty much a snowfall from the very beginning. Um, so I was able to, to grow my company relatively quickly, um, just based off of word of mouth. Um, I, I think I got to a point where I was kind of putting the, the cart before the horse. 
um, hiring really fast, just doing a, making a lot of big decisions really quickly. And uh, by the time I guess I peaked in terms of having, uh, uh, I think up to thirty some odd employees, and um, there was a merger that we were considering, and um, and uh, you know had a lot of customers, a lot of big contracts. Uh, that's when Uncle Tom came out, the original film in twenty twenty. And um, after the success of that film, uh, Justin and I, we became friends. Justin's the director of Uncle Tom. He, uh, um, him and I became friends and he recognized in me uh, this kind of natural uh, uh, desire to just research. Uh, I'm a researcher by nature. If something interests me, I'm going to obsess over it. I'm going to read on it. I'm going to do all I can to understand it and to get to the bottom of it. And so I naturally have that kind of personality and it was just a perfect fit for uncle tom 2 which is a heavily researched film we spent two years just going into the the weeds on that particular film in the research department and so whenever he made that offer to me um i had decisions to make and i decided to give up you know my portion of the company that i had helped build and just really significantly downscale and all of my focus and attention was on researching and filmmaking um, I still had a company, but I wasn't, I wasn't actively leading it. Um, I left that to my brother who, uh, works with me and for me. And so, um, now that we're in a place where, uh, I'm getting back into my small company, um, one of the biggest things to tie it back into what you're talking about with your dad, that has been really helpful is the fact that, uh, where I used to have an administrative office, we had you know three employees working in the office, and then myself, and then my business partner. So there were five of us in there, focusing on you know accounts, uh, quality control, um, just all the things that go, all the admin things that go with uh, running a small company, um, is left now to myself and my wife, and so we are uh, genuinely a family business. Um, and that's something that I encourage a lot of young men to do is to consider going into business for yourself and making, you know, your wife a participant in that. Um, because whenever you're working alongside your wife in that way, where you're handling not only the affairs of your household, but the affairs of your finances and you're able to uh, to generate income together. Um, there's something special about that. You know what I mean? I, in fact, I would say that that's biblical in many respects. Um, and so she sees, obviously, the struggles uh, that I endure uh, with running my small business because she she's sharing in that. Um, and then we get to share in the victories of our small company as well. And it is the way in which we put food on the table. It is a way that we're able to, uh, in a sense, make a living for ourselves. And not only that, but um, learning from our own mistakes and learning from our own victories as well uh, makes us better parents insofar as we get to uh, teach those lessons and impart those lessons to our children, to teach them not only by what we're saying, but also by what we're exemplifying. Um, lessons that many people spend a lot of money and go to college to learn, uh, mm -hmm. namely the uh, ins and outs and the intricacies of running a small company of you know having uh, of dealing with money in a responsible way and things of that nature so um so to be able to <clears throat> be in a position where uh we can not only be the beneficiaries of the work that we're putting in for our small business but also play an active role as educators as well um is huge so whether we realize it or not i mean um, I don't know what your situation was like with your parents in terms of the small business that your dad ran, but whether he realized it or not, he was an educator in some respects to you. Yes. Um, and so I hope to do the same thing with my kids, uh, but more in an intentional way and not just them kind of endure the kind of of a uh, byproduct of having uh, been a child or a son or a daughter to an entrepreneurial dad, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can go off for an hour on my, my, my growing up with my father, very type A person. And my, my first, I'll, I'll share this with you. My first job was to clean the toilets in his um, 
motor pool because he did a mm-hmm. transportation company where he uh, facilities management transportation where he had SBA loans, a small business association in DC to various entities in the government. And so part of that was a fleet of vehicles. And I thought my first job would be like, you know, a desk job somewhere. No, he gave me a toothbrush yeah. and literally told me to clean the uh, the disgusting motor pool, greasy bathroom where people come in every morning and check out to do their, their routes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's hardcore, man. He's hardcore. But your education was absolutely true. Not as much intentional, but it was definitely um, indirectly. Mm. So, yeah. Um, so I want to bring up, you, t- you touched on the film. And I definitely want to talk about the film, and it, particularly Uncle Tom 2, because Everybody out there, if you haven't seen Uncle Tom 2, you got to check this film out. In, in fact, would you say, um, Chad, that you have to see the first one first? I don't think you have to. No, no. This is a film that stands on its own. Um, you could see some growth even. Like if you watch part one and, and then watch part two after, uh, I think you will definitely see some growth in terms of like just intelligence with regard to where the filmmakers were during Uncle Tom versus where they were for part two. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a film that stands on its own. It's that's not to negate or to take away from the importance of part one. It's just, you know, it, 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 it requires you to kind of put on your thinking cap, uh, to, to, to go into part two for sure. I, I would recommend watching part one for the sole fact of, I mentioned this to Justin, when I interviewed Dr- Justin Malone, the director for the mm-hmm. second one. Uh, I mentioned to him the whole time I'm thinking about during watching the film was empire strikes back. I kept thinking, yeah. and I got that, that vibe that this is this is a much, it's, they're both really good films. Star Wars is good, Empire mm-hmm. is good, but they're both different yeah. films and different tones and different all that stuff. And I was like, wow, mm-hmm. they're actually going there. And it's so exciting to see that come out. And I don't want to go too far in, in spoiler territory, but just take my word for it, watch the film and, and, uh, and watch that. And then put your thinking cap on, like Chad just said. Mm-hmm. But I, I kind of want to go back to a, a, a video that you did, or maybe it was a tweet you, you put out, and it was regard, regarding Oklahoma City. And it's actually the Oklahoma City, the um, the Tulsa, what's oh, it called, yeah. Black Wall Street, the whole yeah. destruction. Greenwood and, District, yeah. Thank you very much. And in the movie, you you, you, you said something there, no, well, you can go ahead and say it here, but it was very profound. That kind of just crushed the entire narrative there. And can you talk about, because I was going to talk about entrepreneurship and family. Can you talk mm. about that situation in parallel to today, why we don't have any excuse if they can do it then with, with um, more racism and today with less, but how would you say that they had more families, more entrepreneurial spirit back then, or what do you think the difference is? And can you talk about why that whole thing, that narrative is actually a falsehood in terms of the black wall street being torn down by white races? No, I'm not give you, I'm not give you a lot there, but take your time on that. Yeah, No, it's a really good question. Um, And so, Yes, you're right. It was a different mindset. It was a different culture uh, in the 1920s than in the 2020s. And that's deliberate. That's that's actually on purpose. Uh, you have to understand, as you do, that the uh, cultural undergird that existed in 1920s Black America uh, was fed into by the likes of George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, who preached, uh, cast down your bucket where you are. In other words, it's incumbent upon you as a man uh, to be a provider, to be entrepreneurial. Not only is it incumbent upon you as a man, it's actually biblical to do that. I mean, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he does not eat. A man that doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Uh, You can see all throughout the Old and New Testament, uh, this kind of uh, onus being on us to uh, be producers. And not only that, but the moral uh, state of black America was very high because it was rooted in the Bible and in faith. And so, you know, for that reason, the average black child grew up with a mother and a father in the house. Um, it was prior to what, uh, Yuri Bezmanov talks about, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Yuri Bezmanov was a former KGB agent who defected. And he talked about how um, the Soviets, the the communists, the Marxists, uh, they had a very difficult time bringing their worldview and their ideology to the mainstream of America. And uh, they they were unsuccessful in doing this for a very long time, at least to the same degree that they were able to penetrate Eastern Europe and 
Asia and all these other countries in Africa, so on and so forth. They had a very difficult time doing it in the United States. And so they had to move somewhat clandestinely. They had to move secretively and they had to co-opt and subvert a lot of American institutions, the federal government, so on and so forth, uh, entertainment, um, journalism. They had to move in a very, you know, kind of undercover way, so to speak. And you can find evidence of this in many of, you know, the communists, uh, common terms, uh, the strategies, their writ. Uh, Leon Trotsky wrote a lot about subversion and, and falsification and co-opting and so on and so forth. And you can see with their own words, them setting their sights on the American Negro. Um, they wanted to, in a sense, cause this kind of, of mindset shift to move uh, Black Americans away from this kind of entrepreneurial uh, faith-based spirit to a more uh, antagonistic, uh, rebellious, protesting kind of spirit. That's exactly what they wanted to do. And it was very difficult for them to do that for the purpose of whenever you see groups like the NAACP, which were led by people like uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and others, all of whom were atheists, all of whom were intellectuals in their own right, all of whom were positioned by white Marxists to do the dirty work in terms of shifting Black America to this kind of agitative culture. They were unsuccessful in doing that, especially in the South, because the South was predominantly faith based, both black and white, uh, went to church regularly. Um, contrary to the prevailing narrative today, there wasn't a lot of this hostility and animosity between black and white in the South. Um, a lot of that's exaggerated and exacerbated uh, by people who stand to gain from the kind of friction that uh, that that narrative um, um perpetuates. So they needed um, to co-opt the church because the church was the, the hub. The church was a place uh, where people uh, seemed to do all their gathering and community uh, and things of that nature. And so when it came to people like Dr. Martin Luther King and others, um, these were the people who were able to kind of take this kind of Marxian worldview and inject it into the Negro South uh, by way of the church. And so you see this kind of shifting away from Booker T. Washington's cast down your bucket where you are to, uh, as you get closer to the 60s, Martin Luther King's uh, assertion that, well, we can't be men. We can't uh, be uh, the people that we need to be because our circumstances keep us behind. And so he put this emphasis on our circumstances and he kind of placed the onus on the government to render aid, to pass legislation, to uh, kind of uh, determine the fate of what Black people will be in America. And this did something psychologically in the minds of the average Black man, where we moved more, we moved away from a trying race to now being a crying race. Hmm. Uh, and good. so the fact of the matter is you have these young baby boomers uh, who were the youngsters, the teenagers, the young adults in the 1960s, who began to kind of join the rank of SNCC, of, you know, the SELC, maybe not for all of them explicitly uh, being a part of these organizations, but symp sympathizing with these organizations. He had a very rebellious spirit in the air that existed not only in Black America, but America at large. You had the anti-war movement going on. You had, you had second wave feminism going on. You had the free love movement going on. Uh, Around college campuses, you had uh, groups like the Weathermen, which later became the Weather Underground. Uh, so this kind of rebellious spirit was in the air. Um, this and, and, and the the thing that kind of uh, that spearheaded it was the demoralization tactic that Yuri Bezman, that, Bezman, that Yuri Bezmanov talks about. Um, rock and roll. It showed up in rock and roll. It showed up in just a, a lot of different ways where the youngsters, the, the young baby boomers were in a sense rebelling against the adult generation of their day. And so the young black men uh, whose fathers and grandfathers started businesses, uh, those youngsters weren't interested in continuing those businesses. Uh, in yeah. fact, when they came of age in the 70s and 80s, to the extent that they've inherited the, the land, the houses, the businesses that their fathers and grandfathers started, these youngsters, as they became adults, liquidated those assets and spent that money on 
trinkets and vacations and cruises and so on and so forth. So to the extent that you have youngsters today talking about, oh, we don't have any generational wealth because of slavery. No, your fathers and grandfathers had land. They had businesses. They had houses. Your parents decided to liquidate those assets instead of passing down that wealth onto you. So there went your generational wealth. Uh, so mm-hmm. again, a lot of the there's there's a lot more to the story than the narratives that are being pushed today. And so to take it back to what you're specifically asking about with regard to uh, Tulsa and uh, Black Wall Street, the Greenwood District, um, there's a lot more to that story once again than what the prevailing narrative is today. The prevailing narrative is that, well, you know, America talks about capitalism and the free econ- the free market economy, and a person, you know lifting themselves up by their bootstraps. But every time black people try to lift themselves up by their bootstraps, here comes white racists to burn it down. And Tulsa is an example of that. Well, there's a lot more to that story than what meets than what meets the eye. The fact of the matter is communism and Marxism, progressivism was at play here, which is which a lot of people sleep on. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yes. And so like we have to first start with the question of why what does marxists and communists stand to gain from the fall of a black wall street these are after all the people who claim to be on the side of of justice and social justice and they claim to be the liberators of black folks so why why would they have something against the fact that black folks are thriving in on black wall street well the reason they have something against it is because the liberation they want for black folks as a liberation to the Marxist ideology. Free market uh, entrepreneurship is antithetical to Marxism. Uh, the idea of owning property is antithetical to Marxism. Um, these are people who envision a kind of one world order where nobody owns anything, but everybody owns everything. The government owns everything, right? Because they encompass all of uh their hope and dreams and the centralization of the government. And so uh, they think it's unfair for an individual uh, entrepreneur, a rich person to own property, because what about all the people who don't own property? So they have an ideological uh, uh, enmity between um, themselves and people who are doing well. And to the extent that a black person or a black community is entrepreneurial, those people do not need a group like the communists or the Marxists, because why do I need you? I'm successful on my own. I'm successful by myself. I don't need the NAACP. I don't need the communists. I don't need these organizations. And so when it comes to power elitists, they thrive and they are made relevant and necessary to the extent that there's chaos, to the extent that there's friction and division. If there's no friction, if there's no division, if there's no chaos, then they're useless. And so they want to be the heroes, they want to save the day, so they have to make sure that they're always creating friction, that they're always creating tension, so that they can be looked upon as the heroes to come and save the day. And that's exactly what went on um, you had people like um, Richard Lloyd Jones, I think was his name. Um, was it Richard Lloyd Jones? I think it, I think it was. So he was the uh, editor of the Tulsa Tribune. He wrote an article uh, entitled. Um, and that was the article that created a kind of uh, a friction in this mob of white folks who, upon seeing that article, decided to collectivize themselves and to march down to the uh, uh, jailhouse in in pursuit of mob justice. Uh, It turns out that Jones was connected to the Communist Party. Um, He and his wife were, you know, they had their hands in a lot of so-called progressive movements, including uh, what was then known as the Negro Project, um, uh, Margaret Sanger's group. Uh, They had their hands in a lot of these nefarious, uh, very liberal and progressive organizations. And Jones would regularly write articles uh, with the the intent of enticing animosity uh, between black and white. He would always write these articles 
uh, that would seem to kind of be flaming the flames of the Klan. Uh, on the other side, you had a man named A.J. Smitherman, who was uh, with the NAACP, and he was the editor of a black newspaper, and he would do the same thing uh, with his newspaper, trying to uh, to entice a kind of animosity uh, among black people against whites. And so both of them, who believed in the same causes, were constantly writing these uh, antagonizing kind of articles. And it worked on that day in 1921 when you had a black mob show up to the jailhouse and a white mob uh, show up to the jailhouse. The two groups began to brawl and one thing led to another and you ended up with a few dozen people dying, both black and white. And you ended up with most a, a lot of the Greenwood district burned to the ground. Um, and so there's a lot more to the story and you'll find once again that these nefarious progressive types, these Marxist types were the ones who were behind it. Um, but they were able to build it back. And that's another thing that they don't tell you. Again, the thing that caused them to build it back was the fact that they weren't demoralized by that point. The blacks weren't. They still had their faith. They still had that entrepreneurial spirit. And it is that faith and that spirit which uh, uh, motivated them to get back to work and to rebuild what was destroyed. And not only that, you had white people who lived in Tulsa who assisted in the building back of Black Wall Street. And so, AJ, or, and so the, the last point I want to make on that regard is uh, Jones wrote an, another article after all this went down and said, we must never let the Negroes rebuild here again. So he wrote that article. But to show you how much of a non-factor he was, uh, not only did they the Negroes build back, uh, white people assisted in the building back of 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 this town because the white people really understood that oh this man is an agitator this man is no good he caused us to uh to uh in a sense step out of our element and we can't let that kind of thing happen happen here again um and so again there's a lot more to the story that i encourage people to really research because to the extent that we continue to allow these left-leaning historians to drive the narrative um we're going to continue to to believe wrongly about history and when we believe wrongly about history uh we misjudge the kind of policies that need to be pushed here and now to shape the future that's a, that's a fantastic way to bring that because that whole thing has been told a different way and people use that as an example of white racist and doing harm to black people who who have done who did nothing and so I want to just uh, say a quick uh, statement here about Jesse Jackson, and then I have a question, or I have a, uh, another statement about history, and I want your comment when I'm done. I actually got a chance to spend about eight hours with Jesse Jackson about 15 years ago at the, I went to a North Carolina a mm -hmm. and he went there as well. And so I was um, invited to, to go there to the opening of the International Civil Rights Museum where the, the Greensboro Four on January or one, I'm sorry, February 1 of 1960, sat at the Woolworth counter in downtown Greensboro. So they turned that into a museum. Hmm. So I'm there with Jesse Jackson all day with my buddy of mine, uh, Lenny McAllister. He's a pundit on CNN and other places. Then he invited me. And so we're there just, you know, hanging out, chilling, whatever. And so Jesse's just kicking it. Well, he's, and he's like, okay, I'm, I'm still very conservative. You know, I'm, you know, pro Bush and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm, I'm expecting him to say something really dumb, but he doesn't. He's like, yeah, man. He said, you know, other than Bull Connor and a few other people, he said, no one's really racist back in the South. <laughs> he told me that. He said, no, you know, there's a, you know, people left us alone. We were chill. You know, there are a few um, sheriffs, a few um, county reps, whatever. But for the most part, it was it was chill. Jesse, yeah. seriously. And then when he got before the camera, he changed, he changed. I, I'm, this is, I mean, I am God's my witness on this one. He just basically did a flip when the cameras turn, came on. I'm mm -hmm. like, come on, man, seriously. Anyway. That's my that's my statement there about that, about that. It, it basically backs up what you said in your research and everything else. My dad the same thing. My dad said, you know what? We drank out of the same um, water hole as, as white people back growing up. There was because we were interacting that much up north. It was a little different because there was not much interacting, but down south it was a different story altogether. So let me get back to your statement about Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. because uh, Booker T. Washington exemplifies and Lincoln for that matter too 
of the Puritan model of free labor. And they were coming over from Holland, from England, over here because they're being persecuted because they were able to finally read the word of God in their own language. In doing so, they realized, oh, you aren't telling me the truth, the truth, Mr. Um, King or Mr. Mrs. Queen. And so that became a bad thing for the state. They used the clergy to um, basically persecute anyone who disagreed with them. So yeah. they had to run or they wouldn't get killed. But over here, and one of the things people talk about the Civil War, one of the reasons why the North didn't like uh, people in the South, slaveholders, was because they believed in free labor, which meant that if you're just by yourself and you're healthy, by your own um, arms and legs and um, strength, you can build something. That something can turn into a product. That product can turn into a profit. That profit can turn into um, wealth. That wealth can turn you into a middle class to upper class and beyond. And that was all you did was yourself and a, a deep faith in God. Uh, and so that was the big animosity between the North and the South in terms of just a fundamental level. So my question mm -hmm. to you is, because the question to you is, is all this is based on spirituality. And my question to you is this, everything you just said, do you think the communists and the Marxists came after America, American blacks, particularly because of our deep rooted spiritual tie that we had, which I would dare say deeper than many other um, um, cultures because of slavery. And we had to have that sort of faith to get through it all. Is that your take on that? Or had you thought about that? Yeah, I mean, and that's something that they had to figure out over time. Um, whenever the NAACP was started as a, as a group, that was in 1907. And they started what was called <clears throat> the Talented Tenth. The idea being that 10% of Black America is going to save the whole of Black America uh, by Marxist intellectualism. That is to inform the entirety of Black America of their plight and of their disfortune, misfortune and to, uh, to advocate for Marxist policies and to use uh, this kind of new, you know, enfranchised voter block <clears throat> to call upon the government to modify life in such a way to ease the plight uh, on Black Americans. And so it was kind of experimental in a sense. Uh, but as I said earlier, it it took off in New York. Um, but New York is is not like a lot of what happens in New York doesn't always translate across the entirety of the country because again, uh, black people in the South weren't really feeling it, right? Because again, they were very deep rooted. They 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 had a deep rooted faith uh, in the South, and you can't reach people when you're hostile and uh, dismissive of something that they truly believe in. And so this is where Martin Luther King came into the picture. Uh, Martin Luther King was born in Atlanta, Georgia and raised there. He, uh, was a, he was the product of this kind of success that existed in black America. His father and mother uh, were well off and they come from this kind of lineage of black folks who applied the Booker T. Washington model of casting down your bucket where you are. He had a very comfortable living, very comfortable upbringing. And his father was a pastor. He was a very successful pastor, a very gifted orator. Uh, Martin Luther King grew up with a front row seat to his father's eloquence and vigor as a pastor. And he was able to, in a sense, internalize that and make it his own. Uh, by the time he was 15 years old, he was able to graduate high school and go off to college. He writes in his papers that from an early age, he uh, embraced uh, liberalism. Um, he says by the age of 12, he had already rejected uh, the deity of Christ. He disbelieved in the resurrection of Jesus. Again, these are his own words. Um, whenever he did go off to college, he specifically sought out a liberal college and he didn't want to become a pastor, uh, but he was advised to do so. He was encouraged to do so. Um, he believed and bought into Marxism from a very early age and his professors saw in him the Negro pastor who can take their own kind of Marxian ideology 
and to the stubborn Negro South. I say that not because it's my observation. I say that because this is what they said in their letters to each other, his professors did. Um, and he did just that, Martin Luther King. So he was able to deliver the same kind of rhetoric and messaging that the NAACP and other communist groups, Marxian S groups believed in. He was able to take it to the South under the guise of Christianity, under the guise of you know being um, a man of the cloth, so to speak. And this this acted as a kind of subversion or co-option um, because a lot of these these black Southerners who would otherwise be antithetical to anything that smacked of Marxism, um, in a sense, let their guard down and uh, their churches began to join the ranks of the SCLC uh, and other such organizations that were basically Marxist front groups. Not The nonviolent protesting tactic was uh encouraged by Bayard Rustin who received training specifically as it relates to nonviolence from the Communist Party from the CPUSA um and you know the March on Washington was also Bayard Rustin's idea um Stanley Levison uh who was a white Jewish communist uh was basically Martin Luther King's right-hand man. He was the, uh, he, he was a treasurer for a communist front group in New York. Um, Stanley Jones, or not Stanley Jones, but uh, Clarence B. Jones, who was an attorney out of California, was also in that inner circle. And the three of them, Rustin, uh, Jones, and uh, Levison, were Martin Luther King's speech writers. They wrote most of his speeches throughout his career. I say that to say this, um, you can tell once again, by those who were closest to Martin Luther King, those who advised him, those who ordered his steps, uh, and then his willing participation and being what they crafted him into, um, that this was a clear and concise co-option, a uh, subversion of the Christian faith, particularly in the Black South. And this carried over into other uh, aspects of you know, uh, uh, the American church up until this very day. And so um, and so it's important to 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 point all of this out because what they now have the luxury of doing, by they I mean, you know, those on the left, is to say that like um, Jesus himself would have, you know, if if he were here today, he would be a Democrat or he would be a Marxist, right? Because these people were very crafty and kind of blurring the lines between uh, what the Bible teaches and what Marxism desires. And they failed to realize and understand that Marxism is deeply antithetical to the Christian faith, that there is no there is no uh, parallel between what the Bible teaches at all and what uh, Marxism espouses. There's no parallel at all. And in fact, if you're a Christian, like the Bible tells you to test every spirit to see if it's of God. And it takes no uh, more than 10 minutes of research to find out quickly that communism is deeply hostile and antithetical to God and Christianity. It takes, uh, it takes, uh, again, no, it, it take it doesn't take long to figure that out. Um, but again, due to deception, due to, uh, very manipulative. Like again, it doesn't it doesn't take more than ten minutes of research into Karl Marx, who he was, what he believed, to figure out the fact that uh, there is no parallel between Marxism and Christianity at all. Uh, in fact, uh, Karl Marx himself was very antithetical, very hostile toward Christianity, uh, toward God. He himself was an atheist, and not only was he an atheist, he was a, a Satanist. Um, he believed in he, he worshipped Satan. Um, this he, he would write poems praising and worshiping uh, Satan. That's a that's a part of Karl Marx that people don't think about. I know that uh, wow. the same the same is true of of, of of Charles Darwin, by the way. Um, and so and so it's, it's interesting how yeah and, and so if you're a Christian, um, and I understand not everybody is, but to the extent that you are, the Bible literally says to test every spirit to see if it's of God. And so if you're honest with yourself, 
And if you're intellectually honest and you believe, as many people suggest today, that uh, Jesus, if he were around today, if he were here in the flesh, he would be a Democrat. He would be fighting for social justice. Uh, again, it takes no more than 10 minutes of, of solid research to find out that that's not true at all. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I am um, learning more about the pilgrims and learning more about uh, that whole movement and about just that through wall builders, David Barton, and I'm, I'm a constitution coach with Patriot Academy. Mm, nice. This this country was 100% founded on the Bible. I mean, it's so mm -hmm. rooted. I mean, there is no, and if it's rooted in the Bible. And I, I can go off on a long tangent there. But let me bring up something on the screen here that I put in an op-ed. If, if I, I'm going to get your opinion on this, take on this, because I am a six-day creationist. I believe that Darwin, we can go on that if you want to, if you want to get to, uh, <laughs> to, get to creation of <laughs> science and all that stuff. Uh, Ernst Haeckel, all those guys, you know. Um, let me put this on the screen here. Um, the second line there where I say, um, I can also submit as a creationist, I feel the theory of macroevolution must fully be rejected in order to maintain a constitutional republic, promoting ideologies, causes, et cetera, that go against the aforementioned Christ is the only way to heaven, six-day creationism worldview, which I believe, by definition, is woke. Um, and I, I'm basically trying to say that that wokeism, and based on your definition as well, which I think is the best definition, which we're going to talk about in a second here, I got you for your Twitter, mm -hmm. definition I've seen on, on wokeism ever, I'm using it all the time, and giving you credit, by the way. Um, so do you want to kind of jump into that a little bit? Because I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about King a little bit, uh, MLK, because let me just do this. Let me just talk, make a statement on King real quickly. Because I've heard you say that you have never seen any of his, um, all, all of his videos, you watch all of them that are available, we mm -hmm. ever mentioned an evangelical message about um, about the Bible. I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, can you comment on that before I move on some to the wokeism part of it? Yeah, I mean, as you said, um, in, in the research for the films, we did look at every second of every minute of every hour of piece of footage that exists uh, on Martin Luther King. Um, not only that, but I've read all seven volumes of his books, of his papers. And in those papers, you have uh, sermons that he delivered. And in none of those things did I ever find him actually preaching the gospel without some kind of uh, ulterior uh, political motive. Um, to the extent that he does mention God or Jesus, he does so uh, under the guise of pushing some kind of political agenda if you look at the sermon or speech in its entirety. Um, so he secured a job as a pastor of a church uh, upon graduating from seminary, uh, but he spent very little time actually preaching um, on Sundays at that church. He really got right to work as being a kind of activist. And so he spearheaded what we now see uh, when it comes to people like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson, who call themselves reverends. Uh, another one is William Barber, who is the leader of Martin Luther King's uh, Poor People's Campaign. So you have all these, these people running around calling themselves reverends, and they're respected as such by the mainstream media. Uh, anytime, you know, for example, uh, Al Sharpton makes an appearance on CNN or what have you, they introduce him as the Reverend Al Sharpton. And what that does to the casual observer is implants in their mind like, oh, this man is worthy of respect because he's a man of the cloth. He's a reverend, right? And so it's all, once again, manipulation and deception. It's rhetoric. It's semantics. Uh, because we tend to give credit or credit and, and, and authority to people who have positions of authority, of authority in terms of what acronyms or what have you are you know, around their name. And so this was spearheaded by Martin Luther King the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who traveled the world preaching and teaching about social justice. Uh, he is the one who once again emphasized, uh, not only did he emphasize, he exaggerated the existence of Jim Crow and the effects that it had on the black man. Uh, never mentioned the fact that a lot of these Jim Crow laws were being repealed at the municipal and state level. Uh, as a result of people just naturally coming together, as Denzel Washington uh, famously said, at least I think it's famous, uh, you can't legislate love. The president of the United States or the Congress cannot legislate love. Uh, people have to uh, 
uh, innocents come together or have a reason to come together and to the extent that they come together they're familiar they're familiarizing themselves with each other realizing and seeing the humanity in each other and to that extent will barriers break down but to try to artificially fast track it you're actually causing a lot more harm and damage than you are good and this was already happening uh, prior to the 1960s all Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement managed to do was to make matters worse in many respects but not only that but they managed in securing power for wow. the federal government and expanding wow. the role of federal government and that's another thing that i wanted to uh to really uh make a point <laughs> Man, on this before is, we this got is, into wokeism this is, this is this is great no we, we, we may skip wokeism i got more to say on this go ahead no, no, there's, there, i wanted to make this point before we got into wokeism so like when it comes to when it comes to social justice right people fail to understand the relationship that the power elite has with social justice movements because people think that there's no relationship people think that there's no uh, interest that a, a billionaire would have with the social justice movement there's definitely a relationship there the reason why people don't think there's a relationship is because when it comes to people like aoc and bernie sanders what is their mantra tax the rich you know uh, they're constantly going after the so-called you know, top 1%, the billionaires, the, the uber wealthy. Um, and so you would think that there's natural kind of caked in hostility between the uber rich and, and uh, you know, uh, power elite and social justice movements headed by the likes of AOC and Bernie Sanders. But there's definitely a relationship there. And when you think about social justice movements and wokeism, for the past century or more, the net result of literally every social justice movement has been the usurpation of our rights as American citizens and the expansion of the federal government. Because essentially what the social justice movement is, is the American citizen begging wow. for the government to grow, to expand itself, right? And so additionally, when you look at these social justice movements, you'll find for the past century or more, They've always been funded by the power elite, always 100% funded by the power elite. So they have a vested interest in seeing to it that these social justice movements are successful. Yes, and including the civil rights movement. Now, why do they have a vested interest in funding these movements? Well, you have to consider the fact that a lot of the politicians, the elected officials are in the back pocket of these power elites. And to the extent that the Constitution limits the powers of these politicians who are in their back pocket, that limits subsequently the nefarious acts that these uber elites can do. And so they have a vested interest in seeing to it that the government's power expands because to the extent that the government's power expands, so too does their ability to engage, uh, so too does the uber elites ability to engage in nefarious activity expands. Right. Yep. And so it's to that it's to that extent that they have an interest in, in in funding and supporting these social justice movements uh, in the kind of climax of a social justice movement where emotions are high, where sensation is high. Uh, you have people who believe that it's morally sound and good for the government to pass legislation that will expand its role. Um, when that victory comes down the pipeline, these pawns, these kind of cogs in the wheel who were part of that social justice movement feels genuinely that they were part of this victory. And that is, is due primarily and solely to their own tenacity, to their ability to take to the streets, to their ability to picket and carry signs. They genuinely believe that it was just their effort that caused this victory. They they pay no attention and pay no mind to the man behind the curtain, uh, the uber elites who funded these things. It was all a game all along. And so what the media does is that they come along and say, well, look, all of this success is embodied in this social justice leader. All of this success is embodied in Martin Luther King. You know, if we're talking about climate change, all of the success is embodied in Greta Thunberg not realizing that these people are mere pawns. These people are mere cogs in the wheel. The whole stage is set, funded, and saw, and seen through, once again, 
by the power elites who stand to gain from the expanded role of the federal government in our lives. And so that for me is the reason why I'm against wokeism. I'm against uh, social justice because you'll find 10 times out of 10 that the net result, the net desire of these movements is to chisel away uh, at our rights as American citizens to, in a sense, defy the Constitution and to expand the role of the federal government in our lives. But we think that, oh, we have more rights now because we passed this, we passed this bill, we passed this legislation. Now we're free. No. Uh, again, it, it, it kind of goes and plays. It, it, it takes the, the thing is, is like you have to be uh, significantly dumbed down as an American citizen to see or believe that these social justice movements work more for your benefit than to your detriment. Incredible, incredible. So I want to say one thing about Lee Atwater, because I want to corroborate what you said about King and the civil rights movement um, pretty much already dying. There's a book called The End of um, American, The End of Southern Exceptionalism, or I'm sorry, it's it's a book that goes through the history of, of the South and how as the South become more, um, it became more Republican as it became more younger and, and more people mm -hmm. coming in, it was becoming more progressive because people wanted the idea of upper mobility, lower taxes, strong national defense, because we're talking about Cold War here. We're talking about Sputnik mm -hmm. going up. People are, are mm -hmm. less worried about the dude on the street corner versus a, a satellite that could uh, launch a nuclear attack on this country. So right. that was a big issue. So that was already shifting more conservatively. And Lee Atwater, and he, he's infamous for, his, for a tape that he did where he used the N-word six times, I believe. I mm -hmm. went to that entire audio tape in full context and proved that he was only using it as an example off the record to, 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 to state the fact of what I just said. So the whole thing was just totally blown out of proportion, um, but it corroborates everything you just said, that he said that during Nixon and during Eisenhower, the country was becoming less racist because of those issues, and it was just a matter of time. It was going to die on the vine mm -hmm. on its own. And what you said there just blows my mind that all this was about expanding government. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. So I got you for a few more minutes here, um, Chad. I'm going to bring up this, this uh, tweet here that you... Um, said on, on definition of communism and wokeism. And I want to get your opinion. You can close this out any way you like after that. But this is something that I replied to a, a person who was trolling me on YouTube. And I just used your quotes to, to, um, to beat him off me. So I, I said, he, this is what you said here. He said, um, can you please explain communism? Can you please explain wokeism? Can you please explain socialism? So this is what I put. I said, hey, um, what communism, a superset of socialism say, this is your quote, um, Chad, that's brilliant from each according to his ability to each according to his need. What communists mean is from each according to his ability to the point of a gun at the threat of the gulag to each <laughs> according to his need by way of rations. Brilliant. And then, and then you said what well, wokeism is, is um, a word that communists like to title themselves in order to come off as caring and insightful since communists has a negative connotation to it. As an added measure of deception, they project their nefarious lust for big government onto conservatives by calling them fascist. I gave you a quote there. Thanks, Chad o. Jackson. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant stuff there. I'm going to use that as much as I can, as you allow me to use that. Um, just can you comment on that and kind of wrap us up in this whole discussion? Because I think you really nailed the big thing here. To me, the takeaway is big government, and we can use this to superset or um, uh undercut a moral fabric so that we can get more power and push a satanic, I say a satanic agenda mm -hmm. on this country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with regard to the first quote there um, about, you know, from each according to your ability to each according to their need. I mean, that sounds great. I mean, it certainly sounded great to me when I was young. Uh, this kind of like kumbaya, everybody coming together and, and living and uh, basically participating in, uh, in uh, society uh, as they can without expecting any money in return. But, you know, we can just barter in this kind of utopia, uh, you know, and get along with each other. Like that sounds good, but what, what then do you do about the people who don't want to participate in that? Like, what do you do with those people, right? Uh, nobody knows. Um, but what we can do is look to history to figure out what has been done historically uh, with those people, whether you're talking about Cuba, whether you're talking about uh, the Soviet Union what, and what have you, or, or China even, these people were <laughs> murdered in cold blood 
and and buried in mass graves. That's that's exactly what happened to these people. To the extent that you're looked at as the opposition, to the peop- to the extent that you look at as the enemy, to the extent that you you're looked at as the political adversary, uh, you're done away with. Like you're sent to the gulag. Your head is chopped off. You're put into you know gas chambers, so on and so forth. And so that is the fate of those who do not believe what these people believe. And so it's a lot of kumbaya until until the rubber hits the road. Um, another thing I think to to point out, just if, just if I can use an analogy, is that whenever you see a, a commercial on television of a pharmaceutical company um, advertising their medication, right? They're talking about all the glories and the wonders that this medication will will uh, will cause, will will have if you take it, right? But then at the end of the commercial, they give all of the side effects. They go through it really fast, but they give you the side effects of, you know, a lot of the downsides of having taken this medication. Uh, we don't do the same thing with politics, especially on the left. They, they never do the same thing where they talk about all the benefits and all the glories of their policy. Uh, they, they, they conveniently forget to talk about all of the negative downsides and side effects of their policy. And so thankfully we have people like, uh, myself, like you, and like the great Thomas Sowell, who, you know, Thomas Sowell is just brilliant because, you know, he writes books like The Vision of the Anointed and um, and all of these other books that talk about who these people are. They're, they're the social engineers. They're the people, the, the expert class who claim to be anointed. They, presu- they assume this position. Uh, they have all these wonderful policies, right? Uh, and it's very difficult to judge the effectiveness of their policies because the uh, um, we, we don't look at it much the same as we look at, for example, tangible things like a bridge. Um, if an engineer or an architect designs and builds a bridge and the bridge is very aesthetically pleasing, it looks beautiful, it has all these little intricacies, and they have their grand opening. And upon passing over that bridge, it collapses. And all the cars fall into the water and the people drown. That will be a travesty. It will be a scandal. And people will seek the heads of those engineers and architects who designed the bridge and did an incompetent and poor job of building it, right? Why do we not do the same thing with regard to the social engineers who are pushing these policies that end up having a more detrimental effect on society than a beneficial one? How do you calculate that? How do you, uh, you know, monitor that? Well, we do have industries to do that, but they do a very poor job of it because they are in cahoots with and are collaborating with a lot of these social engineers. We have all these so-called public intellectuals, the likes of Noam Chomsky, of Cornell West, of, you know, the list goes on and on and on. These very leftist Marxist uh, uh, thinkers, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, again, the list goes on and on. All of their, the policies and the ideas that they have are abysmal when they are taken to their logical conclusion and to the extent that they inform and help shape public policy that is enacted into law. They have a very detrimental effect on our society and nobody stops to think about what conditions overall were like before those policies were implemented versus what they're like now. And so, you know, I hope to see more think tanks that study things like this and that bring that information into the general public in a palatable way for the average layman to understand so that we can begin to distrust uh, these public experts, these public intellectuals more and more. Um, there's no reason why the likes of Cornell West should be, you know, having these primetime spots on cable news, uh, disseminating their poison into our society. No reason at all. But the reason that they they continue to get their play, the reason they continue to to be looked at as great and respected by society is because nobody knows what the heck they're talking about, but they sound intellectual, they sound good. And it's to that extent that we continue to put them on this kind of pedestal and it's unfortunate. And so again, um, I, I think people like Thomas Toll uh, are important for this, uh, 
for this reason that they kind of place scrutiny on the social justice warriors, the kind of woke uh, uh, warriors who are continuing to run our, our culture and our society into the ground. So that's fabulous. That's fabulous. I could go on and on, but, um, I only have you here for about an hour. I want to be, uh, <laughs> respectful of your time, uh, Chad. Um, this discussion is, is brilliant. And I, I really like to say about Cornell West about him saying the word salad, cause that's what they do. You know, that's the word yeah. salad. And, mm-hmm. um, I tell my wife, I, 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 I joke with her. Cause I used to be one of these leftists back in college, whatever. And I'd be like, you know, you could just say big words like, yo, brother, man, the, the spore of the, the of the of the intellectual of the Benin culture of the nefarious needs of the white man. You just I can go on and on and you say yeah. absolutely nothing. You sound good. Right. You know, um, so, <laughs> so I'm, crazy. I'm, I'm having a good time here. So, um, well, Chad, is there anything that you want to um, let the audience know about yourself or in terms of um, where they can get a hold of you, how they can support you um, and where they get a hold of you? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Instagram and YouTube uh, at Chad O'Jackson. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I got some other projects up my sleeve that I'm cert- excited about. So uh, you can definitely follow me in those places if you want to see what I'm up to. Uh, I also started a website, chadojackson.com. Um, there's some, there's some, you know, projects I want to tackle. I want to uh, perhaps write either a a short piece or maybe even a book about the presidency of one of my favorite presidents, uh, Grover Cleveland. Um, and so if you want to, again, uh, just know what I'm up to, then then feel free to, to go to my social media or my website and sign up and you'll get to see all that information. I would love to pick your brain on Grover Cleveland. I don't know anything about the man. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm a, more of a James Polk kind of guy from Paul. Oh, gotcha. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, even though I know he was a, oh, we, we can go on, we can go on, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really curious about that. I love U.S. presidents. I think they're mm-hmm. fascinating, all fascinating. So, yeah, for sure. All right, well, um, Chadwick Jackson, thank you so much, uh, everybody. Uh, if you go follow him, check him out, support him. He is a wonderful resource, a wonderful mind. I can't wait to hear what he has to uh, say going forward. And all the stuff you have, I'm going to consume it because it's just brilliant. And thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Everybody else, thank you so much for being on The Conservative Take. And please check out this video right here. And uh, we'll see you in the next video.